So, uh, Photon, you can't say I'm not thorough. Andrew, and this is Katie's Toys. You're probably thinking two things. One is that, don't you mean laser tag? And yeah, kinda. And the other thing is, what is there to talk about missing MIA 80s ladies in Photon? Well, we'll get to that too. For those not in the know, Photon was, let's say the original laser tag. They opened up their first arena in Texas in 1984 and really kind of franchised and split out from there. Laser tag came much later in the 80s and both had essentially launched their home devices around the same time in 1986. The problem being, laser tag was just sexier. It just had better branding, it just had a better look, even the marketing was better. So it very much won out in the popularity contest just based off of branding alone. Uh, this is a bit of a Galoob's Golden Girl versus Mattel She-Ra kind of situation where one technically came out first, the second was vastly more popular, so it's kind of assumed that the one that came out first is actually a spell out from that. So this is kind of that. If you want a more complete history on Photon, the technology, the arenas, the games, its relationship and rivalry with Laser Tag, I would recommend maybe checking out Secret Galaxy's video. There's not really a lot of Photon information out there, to be perfectly honest. Uh, it's really more of a flash in the pan, uh, and probably rightly so. But nevertheless, they did all the quintessential 80s things correct. They you know, launched the product, and then once you launch a project, you know, much like Star Wars, you franchise it. So they had a lot of arenas, they made the toys for home use, and they made a toy line and TV series to sort of spin off out of it. The TV show was live action, which at the time I wasn't a big fan of, uh, but very much was a bit of a precursor to Power Rangers. In fact, a lot of the costumes they used were very much from, you know, Japan Power Ranger-y kind of shows. It follows a high school student called Christopher Jarvis, who was, you know, playing Photon and then was plucked out of obscurity, sent across the galaxy and was, you know, met with other people who, you know, had photon weapons and they would go and try to get the, you know, MacGuffin photon crystal on these planets. If they tagged it first, it would be teeming with life. If the villains tagged it, it'd be like a barren wasteland. Essentially, this was a big advertising for the arena more so than the toys. The concept of them being plucked away from the arenas is around the fact that, you know, these, you know, the supercomputer called mom of all things, was looking for great warriors across the planet. Um, this was essentially a way for you to go into the arena and think, well, if I'm real good at it, maybe I'll be chosen too. And this is a kind of emotional manipulation that I kind of loathe and I'm a little embarrassed about. Specifically because even as a child, you know, I knew logically the Force didn't exist. But since the Force was in a galaxy far, far away a long, long time ago, you know, maybe it took a little while to get here. So more than many times, I was the person who reached out to try to pick something up. And, you know, nothing really happened except for some, you know, bent spoons, nosebleed, some men in black took me on a car ride. But, like, by and large, it was just a source of embarrassment. And this sort of photon, you know, mind games <laughs> really stuck a nerve with me. All of this is to say that this dumbass high school kid went off into space and for reasons unknown decided to have an alias. Uh, he went by Bodhi Lee, L-I. I don't know why he needed an alien in space from just some obscure high school student, but be that as it may, he chose a douchebag name. Uh, he was joined by aliens, let's just call it, you know, kind of elaborate puppets at best, um, and some decent, you know, special effects for the time on TV. Uh, the subject of today's video, however, will be Tivia, the Princess of Nivia. Not even joking. Even better than just that title, she was a, you know, as Wikipedia puts it, a black ninja princess, which just, yes to that word salad. Um, she wore a really great, very, you know, almost like, Power, again, Power Rangers-y kind of costume. Um, great color scheme. I just like, I liked her look quite a bit. Uh, she was from a planet, essentially of Amazons. All the men on her planet had gone extinct, and they were sort of, you know, these warrior women that bore out of that. 
Would she and Bodhi ever get together and have this, you know, star-flung romance? We'll never know, because there's only one season. 26 episodes, so nothing to sneeze at. But uh, at the very least, they did have a series finale, because I think they knew the writing of the wall before, I believe, before they even shot the thing. As was, you know, the correct thing to do in the 80s when you're trying to franchise something out, is you get toys made out of the, you know, in this case, the toy gun and the TV show. There was, let's say, an attempt to make them. There was certainly a single two-pack that came out with very beefy Bodhi, as well as Warrior, Warrior. Uh, you know, he sounds like a army builder, so I hate when they put those into two-packs. There's legends of other figures coming out. Uh, it's really hard to pin that down. And again, because there's so little information on Photon, particularly the show and the toys, cannot confirm or nor deny. There was certainly a much more expansive wave shown uh, pretty much just in one catalog. And there you can really see Nivea in her colors. Um, and it was quite shocking just how expansive this line wanted to be when in fact they just sort of put out a very expensive, very tech heavy two pack that probably just blew parents out of the water because you know, it was too expensive. These toys suffered the fate of a few others for a few reasons. Uh, one being is that they were eight and a half inches tall, which was just wildly huge, even by today's standards. I mean, you have to bear in mind, even as far as the late eighties when these had come out, the standard still was very much, you know, three and three quarter, four inch. By the time we get into the 90s, we're looking more into the four to five inch kind of range, but still, these were along the lines of Brave Star or Sector. And Brave Star is important to note because these also were packed with that same kind of laser light technology that everybody seemed to try to get on board at that time. We saw it with Thundercats, we saw it with He-Man. It was really baked into the play pattern of Brave Star and Captain Power. Again, Brave Star, Sectors, too big, this technology too expensive for a small figure. And it's, it's unfortunate because it's sort of a good idea, but all of this was way ahead of its time. You know, figures were made smaller, largely because of the oil crisis of the early 80s, but I mean, that's sort of, you know, we were trained to adapt to that, you know, play pattern. We understood, you know, small figures meant we could get cool vehicles. So these were, were too big, too tech heavy, too complicated, and you know, frankly also, not laser tech. I keep confusing Tivia and Nivia. Anyway, Princess Tivia, the figure, quite nice. Uh, again, because they were so big, you really got a lot of details. So I mean, just looking at the figure itself, wonderful details, you can really see almost like a cloth kind of pattern on her legs. Uh, stuff you could do in that size that you couldn't do with a smaller G.I. Joe kind of scale. So really, really great looking. We've seen a few prototypes, you know, floating around the internet. Um, colored, we saw, you know, just a very small you know, picture uh, from the catalog, but by and large, really good. One other interesting thing of note, and this is sort of a, a topic, let's hope we don't have to discuss again, but crotches. So photon and crotches, you're getting a big education here today. So the industry, you know, kind of standards are T crotch or V crotch. T crotches are something you would find, say, in Star Wars or superpowers, where it's very much cut down and the legs, you know, swivel up at a 90 degree angle very easily. They they work well for, you know, sitting for one thing, uh, putting into vehicles essentially is what the real thing is. Uh, they're also, you know, it's a very minimal kind of articulation. Also, weirdly. The toy industry considers that masculine because I guess it's a bigger, meatier crotch. On the flip side, the V crotch, and I think you know where this is going, kind of goes up the legs. Um, it looks good for the sculpt. It doesn't break up the sculpt as much as a T crotch would. So anyone you know looking to maintain the look of the figure without kind of really concerning about how that affects the way they sit how the legs look when they go in different directions. You know, it, it's really much more for aesthetics than usefulness. It's also, you know, considered female because it sort of looks a certain way. I find it kind of interesting that the V crotch was employed here in this toy line, sort of, you know, late 80s, but still not quite getting into the 90s, where it was very prevalent, particularly with Playmates, particularly when they worked with Barner Studios. They were very concerned about the sculpt and the look and the, you know, flow of that. You would see it, you know, really with April O'Neil's, then it would go on to go with, you know, say Star Trek, almost exclusively did that. So 
very cool to see that, you know, kind of uh, mindset adapted so early. I know it's a strange thing to fascinate on, but um, I think it's cool. Also, of some obvious note, it's really great to see a black woman as a lead character, you know, a, a, a sidekick kind of character, but regardless, you know, like a star of the show and an important one at that. I mean, especially in the 80s, this was rare. There were some, you know, black female action figures we were supposed to get, like from G.I. Joe. However, you know, this was a real rarity. The only one I could even think of off the top of my head is Diana from Dungeons & Dragons. And frankly, she didn't even get a figure. So that's Tivia and Photon in the 80s. How has she fared since? Poorly, badly, of course. I mean, the fact that I even had to really dig for information on Photon just goes a long way to tell you that no one's really talking about it. Whenever, you know, live streams happen where people say, you know, what 80s line would you like? Photon is never mentioned. Um, I'm not expecting any kind of, you know, resurgence of this. So uh, it's unfortunate we never got the figure back in the day. It's, it's unfortunate we're not getting it now. I mean, I, it's, it's one of those things lost of time, and it's not something that, you know, I bemoan here. But for the sake of being thorough, here we are. But how did Photon the game turn out? Also abysmal. Laser Tag clearly won the branding wars of that. To the point, you know, they're still being used, if not mostly in name only, to this day. So, again, no one's really clamoring for this. No one's, you know, gonna, you know be sad that we never get a, a Tivia action figure or a Photon Resurgence, but I like to be thorough, so here we are. And that is Photon and the Tivia action figure that we never really wanted to begin with. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for sitting through a Photon education <laughs> and crotches. Uh, if you like this video, please like it, comment, share, subscribe, and I will see you next time on MIA 80s Ladies.